All right, so we're going to talk about two or three topics today. Uh, and the first one is going to be kind of a review of some of the functions that exist in PyTorch um, and kind of when and how to use them. Um, so the first, uh, the first set of topics is about activation functions. And um, there, there's a whole bunch of them defined in, in PyTorch. And they basically come from you know, various papers that people have written where they claim that this or that particular objective function or activation function works better for their problem. So uh, of course, everybody knows the ReLU. Uh, that's a very standard one. Uh, but there's lots of variations of ReLUs. These ReLUs where the, the, the bottom part is not uh, constant and set to zero, but it can be allowed to change either only with a positive slope or forced to be to have a negative slope, or sometimes um, uh, being random in the case of the, the randomized leaky ReLU. Um, so they have uh, you know nice names like leaky ReLU, prelu, re ReLU, random ReLU, etc. Um, so leaky ReLU is one where you allow the bottom part to have uh, a, a slight negative slope. Uh, and that kind of uh, prevents the issue that sometimes pops up that, you know, when a ReLU is off, it doesn't get any gradient. So here, here you get a chance uh, for that uh, system, that, that um, function to actually propagate gradient and perhaps do something useful, can go all the way to kind of complete full rectification of the signal, uh, kind of like an absolute value if you want. Uh, Prelu is one also, where you, yeah, go ahead. The previous, the previous, uh, the previous activation was, uh, is usually using the uh, discriminator in a GAN, such that we always have ga um, gradients going backwards for the generator. And also this activation was necessary in order to train uh, the very skinny network I show at the beginning of the class, because again, having like a very, very skinny network, it was basically impossible to get uh, gradients flowing back because we were like ending up in one of the uh, quadrants without, you know, where everything was zero out and then nothing would have been actually uh, trained if you wouldn't have used, you know, uh, this uh, activation function that allows me to get some kind of gradients, even if we are in the regions where we are trying to suppress the output. So, yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> So prelu is uh, fairly similar, except that now the the, the slope uh, in the negative side can be just about anything. Um, and okay, what's what's interesting about those uh, all those functions that we just saw is that they are scaling invariant in the sense that uh, they you know you can multiply the signal by two, and the the output will not be. Uh, changed. Yeah, I mean, it would be multiplied by two, but otherwise unchanged. So they are equivalent to scale. Uh, th there's no sort of intrinsic scale in those in those functions, right? Uh, because there's only one nonlinearity, and it's a sharp one. So now we're getting into functions where the scale matters. So the amplitude of the incoming signal will affect the type of non the type of uh, uh, nonlinearity that that you're going to get. And one of those is the, the soft plus. So soft plus is sort of a differentiable version of uh, ReLU, if you want. It's, uh, it's kind of the soft version of positive part. And it's usually uh, parameterized, uh, as you can see at the top here, one over beta log one plus exponential beta x. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the log sum exponential um, that we've been using a lot for sort of various purpose. Except here, one of the terms in the sum is uh, equal to one, which is kind of like exponential zero, if you want. Um, so that looks like kind of uh, a function that sort of asymptotically is the identity function for large positive values and asymptotically is zero for negative values. So it approximates the ReLU. Um, it has a scale parameter though, this, this beta parameter. The larger beta, the more the function will look like a ReLU. So the, the kink will be kind of the corner will be kind of sharper if beta goes to infinity. Um, but that, that function has a scale. Um, now, you can parameterize those functions in, in various ways. And this is sort of a, another example of uh, kind of a soft uh, version of, of ReLU, if you want, uh, where, where here you, you use ReLU as a basis, and then you add a, a small constant to it that kind of makes it smooth. Um, you know, I can't tell you that any of those has any particular advantage over the others. Uh, it, it really depends on the, on the problem, but they, they all have kind of similar properties, if you want. Uh, this also you can make sort of continuously uh, uh, closer to ReLU. Um, that's uh, yet a, 
Uh, okay, so one one difference here um, in this case is that uh, this guy actually goes negative, right? So unlike the ReLU that um, uh, has its minimum at zero, this its horizontal asymptote at zero, um, this guy goes below zero. Uh, and that may or may, or may not be advantageous depending on the application you have. Uh, sometimes it's advantageous because it allows the system to basically make the uh, average of the output zero, uh, which is advantageous for certain types of uh, uh, for gradient descent convergence, the weights that are connected to units like this will see both both positive and negative values, which will then converge faster than if they only see positive values. Um, so it's a bit the same here, and uh, it's just a kind of a differently, you know, a different parameterization of kind of the same thing, if you want, um, with different properties. So of course, there's tons of variations of this, you know, with various parameters with different properties. Um, um, and, you know, some of them that have particular uh, uh, properties that uh, kind of relate them to um, uh, Gaussian distributions, for example. Um, this is not the commutative distribution of a Gaussian, but, um, okay, so those, those were things that have one kinks in them. And if the kink is sharp, there's no scale. If the kink has some scale in it, there is some scale, but it's still sort of a, a single kink, nonlinearity. Now we're getting into nonlinearities that have two kinks. Okay, so this one is basically a saturating ReLU. Uh, I'm not sure why it saturates at six, um, you know, why not? Um, but, you know, why not parameterize this uh, a little better? So here's a smooth uh, function that you're familiar with because it's used in, in recurrent nets, in gated uh, recurrent nets, in LSTM, in uh, softmax. You know, basically this is a, a, a two-way softmax. You can think of it this way. Um, <clears throat> And this is just a function that goes kind of smoothly between zero and one. Um, uh, it's uh, sometimes called a Fermi Dirac function as well because it derives from um, uh, some work in physics instead of sequel physics. Um, and then there is uh, the hyperbolic tangent that we also uh, talked about. It's basically identical to the sigmoid except it's centered. So it goes between minus one and plus one and it's a little, uh, you know, it's twice the amplitude and the, the gain is a little different but uh, it plays the same role. The advantage of hyperbolic tangent is that the uh, output is, you can expect the output to not have zero mean, but be close to having zero mean. And again, uh, that's uh, advantageous for the weights that follow because they see positive and negative values and they tend to converge faster if that's the case. Um, so I used to be a big, a big fan of those. Um, unfortunately, if you stack a lot of sigmoids uh, in many layers in a in a neural net, uh, you 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 can tend to not learn very efficiently. Uh, you have to uh, be very careful about normalization if you want the system to uh, to converge if you have many layers. So in that sense, the the, the single kink functions are better for deeper networks. Um, so his soft sign. This is basically a a bit like the, the sigmoid, except that it's, uh, it doesn't get to the asymptote as fast. So it doesn't get stuck uh, towards the asymptote um, as quickly. So one problem with hyperbolic tangent and, uh, and the sigmoid is that when you get close to the asymptote, the, the gradient goes to zero fairly quickly. And so if the weights of a, of a unit become too large, they kind of uh, saturate this unit and the, the gradients get very small and then the, the unit doesn't learn very uh, very quickly anymore. Um, uh, it's a problem that exists both, uh, sorry, both in sigmoids and hyperbolic tangent. And so uh, soft sign is a function that, that was proposed by uh, Yosha Benju and some of his collaborators and it kind of saturates slower uh, so it doesn't uh, have the, that same problem. Uh, I mean, it has the problem also, but not to the same extent. Okay, and this is kind of the opposite hard tangent, high, hard 10H. Uh, I, I don't know if it deserves that name, but it's basically uh, just a ramp. Okay, uh, and that works surprisingly well, uh, particularly if your weights are somehow kept within a, a kind of small value, so the the the, the units don't saturate too much. Um, it's surprising how well it works. Um, and you know, people have used this in sort of various contexts. Uh, <clears throat> but that's sort of you know, non-standard. So hard threshold is very rarely used because you can't really propagate gradient through it, okay? And this is 
really what kept people from inventing backprop in the 60s and 70s, which is that they were using binary neurons. And so they didn't think of the, the whole idea of, uh, of gradients because of that. Okay, those other functions are rarely used in the context of uh, neural nets uh, or, or at least for kind of activation function uh, in a traditional neural net. They use mostly for uh, sometimes for things like sparse coding. So one step in sparse coding consists in uh, to compute the value of the latent variable uh, consists in shrinking uh, all the values in the latent variable in the latent vector. Uh, by some value, and you do this with a, a shrink function, a shrinkage function. This is kind of a soft version of a shrinkage function. The hard version is here. Uh, I mean, it's called soft shrink, soft shrink, but uh, it actually has corners in it. Um, the reason it's called soft shrink is because there is a hard shrink that uh, looks different that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so this basically just uh, uh, changes a variable uh, by a constant towards zero, right? And and if it goes below zero, it kind of it's clamped at zero. Um, if if it uh, um, if it's brought too long, um, and so the this is basically just the identity function to which you subtract uh, hyperbolic tangent to make it look like a shrink. Like a shrink. So basically, this one, if we if we try to get the uh, whatever value close to zero, they actually are forced to zero, basically, right? Right, so small values are forced to zero, others are, sh are shrunk towards zero, but you know, since they're large enough, they're not gonna get uh, to zero. So again, that's used mostly as, uh, you know, uh, you can think of it as a step of gradient for an L1 criterion, okay? So if you have a, a variable, you have an L1 cost function on it, and you take a step in the negative gradient of the L1, so L1 cost is an absolute value, uh, this will cause the, the variable to kind of go towards zero by a constant, which is the slope of that uh, L1 criterion, and to kind of stay at zero, um, you know, coming from either side. It doesn't kind of overshoot if you want. And so that's, that's the nonlinear function you would use. And that's one of the steps in the ISTA algorithm that is used for uh, inference in, uh, in sparse coding. Uh, but again, it's, it's rarely used in uh, sort of regular neural nets, uh, unless your encoder is kind of used uh, as, um, kind of a, a, a estimation of uh, sparse coding. Uh, this is the, the hard shrink. So hard shrink basically clamps every value smaller than lambda to zero, okay? So if a value is smaller than uh, lambda or larger than minus lambda, and so between minus lambda and lambda, when lambda is some constant, you just set it to zero. Again, um, it's used for things like, you know, certain types of uh, sparse coding, but rarely as an activation function in the neural net. So log sigmoid is mostly used in cost functions, not really as an activation function either, but uh, it's a useful uh, function to have if you wanna uh, uh, plug this into, into a, a loss function and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that in a minute. Um, so something we've seen, this is the same as softmax, except you have minus signs. Um, so this is sort of more, uh, uh, so, th so those are multidimensional uh, nonlinearities, right? You, you have a vector in and you get a vector out, which is the same size as the input vector. And we know about softmax uh, is, you know, exponential xi divided by sum over j of exponential xj. Uh, this is softmin where you, you put the minus sign in front of the x. So you view the x's if you want as energies instead of scores as penalties instead of scores. And it's a good way of uh, turning a bunch of numbers uh, to uh, uh, something that looks a bit like a probability distribution, which means uh, numbers between zero and one, that's some two one. And that's the softmax, which we all know. Uh, so log softmax, again, is not very much used as a nonlinearity within a neural net, but it's used a lot at the output uh, as kind of one piece of a, of a loss function, and we'll see this in a minute. Okay, so those questions. Yes. Uh, we have a question. Uh, so for Prelo, I'm not sure I understand, number one, why we want the same value for all channels, and number two, how learning A would actually be advantages? Uh, you could have a different A for different uh, channels. Uh, so different units can have a different A. There could be, you could use this, this as, a, as a parameter of every, every unit. Um, or not, it could be shared. Um, I mean, that's kind of up to you. 
Uh, it could be shared at the level of a feature map in a convolutional net, or it could be shared among all feature maps, or it could be individual to every unit. If you really want to preserve the convolutional nature of a convolutional net, you probably want to have the same A for every unit in the feature map, but you, you can have different A's for different feature maps. Um, okay, what was the second question? Uh, why learning actually uh, a specific value would be advantages? Like why are we learning A? Uh, you can learn it or not. You can fix it. Uh, the 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 reason for fixing it would be, uh, you know, not necessarily to kind of have sort of more powerful uh, nonlinearity, but to kind of ensure that the nonlinearity gives you a non-zero gradient, even if it's uh, even if it's uh, in the negative region. Um, so, you know, learnable, not not learnable. Um, so, to make it learnable allows the system to basically turn a nonlinearity into either the a linear uh, mapping, which of course is not particularly interesting, but why not? Uh, a ReLU or something like a, a full rectification, okay, where A would be minus one uh, in, the, in the negative part, uh, which you know, can, be, uh, can be interesting for certain types of applications. So for example, if you have a convolutional net that has an edge detector, an edge detector has a, has a polarity, right? It's, uh, it's got plus coefficients on one side, minus coefficients on the other side. And so it's gonna react. So if you have an edge in an image that goes from say dark to bright, uh, the, you know, the convolution will react positively to this one. But if you have another edge from, uh, uh, from you know, in the opposite uh, direction, then the, the, react, the, the, the filter will react negatively. Now, if you want your filter to react to an edge, regardless of its polarity, you rectify it, okay? So that would be kind of just uh, absolute value. Now you could, of course, bake this in. You don't have to use a prelude, you can just use the absolute value. Uh, probably a better idea is to use a square, actually. So if you take the square, of, uh, a square nonlinearity, it's not implemented as kind of a neural net nonlinearity, but you know, in the functional form of PyTorch, you just write square and that's it. Hope I answered the question. Any other question on this topic? Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, it seems to me like these uh, non-linearities are trying to uh, basically um, make a linear function non-linear, and uh, the the tweak in the in the lines denote like the change in that function. So, like, can we uh, think of this as um, if we want to model a curve? Uh, in the line, should we have learnable parameters on both, like before, uh, before the zero and after the zero on the x-axis? Like, well, so uh, yeah, I mean, there there is diminishing return. So the the question is, you know, how complex do you want your nonlinearity to be? So you could imagine, of course, parameterizing an entire uh, nonlinear function, you know, with spline parameters or busy curves or something like this, right? Or I don't know, Chebyshev uh, uh, polynomials, you know, I mean, you can, you, you can parameterize any, any mapping you want, right? And you can imagine those, those uh, parameters could be part of the learning process. Uh, however, you know, what is the advantage of doing this versus uh, just, you know, having more units in your, in your system and relying on the fact that multiple units will be added in the end uh, to approximate the function you want? Generally, uh, it really depends on what, like if you want to, to do regression in a fairly low dimensional space, so perhaps you want some parameterized nonlinearities, that might help. Um, you might have like, a, you might want to have a, a collection of different nonlinearities uh, with maybe things like, like Chebyshev polynomials if you want to do good approximation, approximations. But for like, you know, high dimensional tasks like image recognition or things like this, uh, you just want a nonlinearity, and it works better if the nonlinearity is monotonic. Uh, otherwise, it creates all kinds of issues because you could have two points that will produce the same output, and so it's a little ambiguous for the system to learn uh, the right function there. Um, so you want it; it's it's much better if the function is monotonic, and almost all the functions here are monotonic, except if you have a negative a here in the in the prelude case. Um, so there's a big advantage to having monotonic functions. Um, um, but in principle, you could parameterize, you know, any function you want. People have played with this, uh, you know, they're not very popular because mostly they don't seem to be bringing a huge advantage in, uh, uh, in, in um, the kind of applications that people use uh, large neural nets for. Other questions?
Uh, another question is going to be kink versus smooth. Yeah. So well, so the question I've had is, can you think of any application where the choice of uh, non-linearity has made a big impact? The only thing I'm aware of is using a single kink function instead of a double kink for deep neural networks helps it train better. Well, so here's the problem with double kink. Double kink has a, has a built-in scale in it, which means uh, if, you're, if the weights of the incoming layer are multiplied by two or if the signal amplitude is multiplied by two, the result on the output would be completely different, right? Yeah. Because you will be, you know, the signal will be more in the nonlinearity. So, um, so you'll get completely different behavior of your layer. Uh, whereas if you have a function with only one kink, if you multiply the input by two, the output gets also multiplied by two, uh, you know, modulo uh, a bias, but let's ignore the bias is fine. So, um, but what I mean to ask is, um, can you think of a situation where the choice of activation function made a, a big difference in the performance of the model, except um, for deep networks using ReLU instead of sigmoid? Um, there is no sort of general answer to this. Um, like, if you're going to use uh, attention, you have to use softmax. I mean, you have no choice, right? I mean, it's not like you have to use softmax, but you want to have something where you get coefficients, right? To to kind of focus the attention of the system on, uh, or, or to kind of spread the attention of the system uh, and not allow it to cheat, which is to pay attention to multiple things at one time. You have to have some sort of normalization of the of, of the coefficients that come out of the attention system, right? So, uh, so normally in most attention uh, systems, like in transformers and stuff, the, the coefficients are, are, are passed through a softmax, so you get a bunch of coefficients that are between 0 and 1 and sum to 1. And so that uh, causes the system to have to pay attention to, uh, you know, a small number of things, right? It can only concentrate the coefficients on a small number of, uh, of items. Uh, and it has to spread it, right? Um, there are other ways to do normalization. You, you can do... Uh, and in fact, there is something that's wrong with softmax normalization for, uh, for, for transformers uh, or for attention, which is that if you want a coefficient coming out of a softmax to be close to zero, you need the input to be close to minus infinity, okay? Or to be considerably smaller than the largest one, right? When you go into a softmax, one output, the largest uh, uh, input is gonna cause the corresponding output to be, the, to be large. But if you want that output to be close to one and all the other ones to be close to zero, you basically want this input to be extremely large and all the other ones to be uh, 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 large and negative, okay? Now, um, uh, that, you know, that, that can be a problem when the, what you are computing at the input are, are dot products because the result is that, uh, you know, the easiest way for a system uh, to, uh, uh, to produce a small dot product is to have two vectors that are orthogonal to each other, in which case the dot product is zero. If you insist that the dot product should be very, very small, then uh, either you have to make the, so you have to make the, the two vectors basically point in opposite directions and you have to make them very long. And that's not so great. And so uh, using softmax for attention basically limits the, 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 the contrast that you're going to have um, between the coefficients, which is not necessarily a good thing. Oh, so, uh, you know, same thing for uh, LSTM, uh, gate, gated uh, uh, recurrent nets, etc. cetera. Uh, you, you, you need sigmoids there because you need coefficients that are between zero and one, uh, you know, that either reset the memory cell or uh, make it a, a pass through so that it keeps its, its previous memory or kind of write the, the, the new input in it. Uh, so there it's nice to have uh, uh, an output that varies continuously between zero and one. Um, there you have no choice. So, I, I mean, I don't think you can say just, you know, in generic term, uh, you know, this, this nonlinearity is better than this other one. There are certain cases where it learns better. There are certain cases where it relieves you from having to initialize properly. Uh, there's certain cases where it works better if you have lots of layers, like, you know, single kink functions work better if you have lots of layers, better than sigmoid-like functions. Uh, there's no kind of, there's no simple answer, basically. 
Can I add a question just regarding the general differences between a nonlinear activation that has kinks versus a smooth um, nonlinear activation? Yeah. Um, is there sort of any general reason or rule to why we would prefer to have kinks in the function or not? It's a matter of uh, scale invariant or scale equivariant. So uh, if the kink is hard, again, you multiply the input by two, the output is multiplied by two, but otherwise unchanged. Okay. If you have a smooth transition, uh, if you multiply the uh, input by, let's say, 100, uh, the output now will look like you had a hard kink. Okay, because the, the smooth part now is, is become shrunk by a factor of 100. If you divide the input by 100, now the, the kink becomes a very, very smooth uh, sort of convex functions. Okay, so it changes the behavior. By, by changing the, the scale of the input, you change the behavior of the, of the unit. And that might be a problem sometimes because um, when, you, when you train a multilayer neural net and you have two layers that uh, are one after the other, uh, you don't have a good control for uh, like how big the weights of this layer are relative to that other weight. So imagine you have a two-layer network where the, you don't have a nonlinearity in the middle. So the system is completely linear, right? Uh, if the network has arrived at a solution, you can multiply the incoming, the, the first layer weight matrix by two, divide the second weight matrix by two, and overall the network will have exactly the same output. Okay, you won't have changed anything. And what that means is that uh, when you do training, there is nothing that uh, forces the system to have a particular scale for the weight matrices, all right? So now if you put a nonlinearity in the middle and you still don't have any constraint for the system to kind of uh, you know, have scales for the first layer weight versus the second layer weight, uh, that um, you know, you, you'd better have a nonlinearity that doesn't care about scale. Okay, so if you have a nonlinearity that does care about scales, uh, about scale, uh, then your network doesn't have the choice of what size weight matrix it can use in the first layer, because that will completely change the behavior. And it may want to have large weights for some other reason, which will saturate the nonlinearity and then uh, kind of create you know vanishing gradient issues. So I, it's not entirely clear, uh, you know what. You know, wh why is it that you know deep networks work better with single king functions? But it's probably due to that uh, scale invariance property or scale equivariance property. Uh, now, there, there would be other ways of fixing this, fixing this problem, which would be to basically set a hard scale on the weights of every layer, so you could like normalize the weights of the layers so that the the uh, the, the variance that of things that go into a unit, you know, is always constant. In fact, that's a little bit what batch normalization does or the various normalization schemes. They do that to some extent. You know, they put the mean at zero and, and uh, the variance uh, is constant. So, so now the variance of the amplitude of the output doesn't depend on the size of the weights because it's normalized. Uh, so, you know, that is partially why uh, uh, things like... Uh, like uh, like batch norm and group norm and things like this uh, help, is because they they kind of fix the the, the scale uh, a little bit. Uh, but then if you fix the scale, then uh, with something like batch norm, you don't the system now doesn't have any way of choosing which part of the nonlinearity is going to use in the two kink function system. Okay, so things like group normalization or batch normalization are incompatible with kind of sigmoids, if you want. If you have a sigmoid, you don't want normalization just before it. I see, that provides some really good intuition. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, question on this? I have one more question. Uh, I noticed uh, in a softmap function, some people use the temperature coefficient. So mm -hmm. in what cases would we want to use the temperature and why would we use it? Well, to, so to some extent, the temperature is redundant with the uh, incoming weight. So if you have weighted sums coming into your softmax, uh, you know, having a, a beta parameter in your softmax equal to two instead of one is the same as just making your weights twice as big. It has exactly the same effect, okay? So that beta parameter is redundant with the size of the weights. But again, if you were, or, or the size of the weighted sum, the variance of the weighted sums, if you want. But again, if you have a, a batch normalization in there, then the temperature parameter matters because now the, the input variances are fixed. So uh, so now the, uh, 
the the temperature matters. Um, the temperature basically you know controls how hard the the you know the the distribution uh, on the output will be. So with a very very large beta, you basically will have one of the outputs equal to one, and all the other ones very close to zero. I mean very close to one and very close to zero. Where beta is small, then it's softer. In the limit of beta equal to zero, it's more like an average actually that you get. Like softmax behaves a little bit like an average. Um, so, you know, beta goes to infinity, it, it behaves a bit like uh, argmax, and beta goes to zero, it behaves a bit like uh, like an average. Um, so, um, so if you have uh, some sort of normalization before the softmax, then tuning this parameter allows you to control this kind of hardness. And uh, what people do sometimes in certain uh, scenarios is that they start with a relatively low beta so that uh, the, the numbers that are produced are kind of soft. So you get gradients everywhere, you know, it's, it's kind of well behaved in terms of gradient descent. And then as learning proceeds, if you want kind of uh, harder decisions in your attention mechanism or whatever, you increase beta. And so that makes the system kind of make harder decisions. It doesn't learn as well anymore, but it's, you know, presumably after a few iterations, it's kind of in the right ballpark. So uh, you can sort of sharpen the, the decisions uh, there by kind of increasing beta. Um, it's useful, for example, in a mixture of, mixture of experts and, uh, you know, self-attention systems are kind of, you can think of as sort of a form of, uh, uh, a, a weird form of mixture of experts. So in mixture of experts, you know, you have multiple sub-networks and their outputs are kind of linearly combined with coefficients that are the output of a softmax itself, uh, uh, you know, controlled by a, a, another neural net. So uh, if you want kind of a soft mixture, you have a low beta, and, and as you increase beta to infinity, basically you're going to select one of the experts and ignore all the other ones. Uh, that might be useful, for example, if you want to train a mixture of experts or an attention mechanism, but in the end, you want to save computation by just determining which expert do I need to compute and just not computing the other ones. So in that case, you want those coefficients to be basically either one or zero. And, and you can train the system progressively to do this by increasing, uh, uh, increasing beta. Uh, this is called, uh, the physicists have a name for this because it uses kind of tricks or various other things. That's called annealing. It has the same meaning as, uh, so annealing comes from, um, uh, metal work, right? You, you're making uh, steel or something and uh, you, you, you make a sword or something, right? And you, you heat it up and then you, 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 you cool it. And depending on whether you cool it quickly or slowly, um, uh, you, you'll, you change the crystal, you know, crystalline structure of the, of the metal. So this idea of annealing of uh, progressively lowering the temperature uh, correspond to this uh, increasing this beta. Beta is like an inverse temperature. It's akin to an inverse temperature. Any other question? I think we are good. All right, okay. So next topic is loss functions. Uh, so PyTorch has a whole bunch of loss functions as you might have uh, seen. And of course, there are things that are uh, simple ones like uh, like mean squared error. So uh, I don't need to explain to you what it is. You know, compute the square of the error between the desired output y uh, and the actual output x. And if it's over a mini batch with n samples, then you have you know uh, n um, uh, losses, one for each of the samples in the batch. And you can you can tell this loss function to either keep that vector or to kind of Reduce it by computing a mean or, or a sum. Okay, very simple. Um, <clears throat> here's a different loss. That's the L1 loss. So this is uh, basically the absolute value of the difference between uh, between the desired output and the actual output. And uh, you want to use this to do what's called um, robust regression. So if you want small errors to count a lot and large errors to count, but you know not as much as if you use the square. Uh, perhaps because you have noise in your data. So you know that you have a bunch of data points, you're, you're trying to kind of train a neural net or something to kind of you know, fit a curve or, or, or you know, do regression. But you know that you have a few outliers. So you have a few points that are you know, very far away from where they should be just because you know, the system has noise or something. Uh, 
uh, or the data was collected with uh, with some noise. So you want the system to be robust to that noise. You don't want the cost function to increase too quickly as the points uh, are are far away from you know the kind of the, the general uh, uh, curve. Um, so uh, L1 loss will be more robust. Now the problem with L1 loss is that it's not differentiable at the bottom. And so, you know, you have to kind of be careful when you get to the bottom uh, of, of how you um, how you do the, the, the gradient. Um, that's basically done with this soft shrink, essentially. That's the, the, that's the gradient of the uh, L1 loss. Um, now, to correct for that, people have come up with um, various ways of kind of making the L1 loss robust for large uh, losses, but then st still smooth at the bottom, kind of behaving like a squared error at the bottom. So an example of this is, uh, is, is this particular function, uh, smooth L1 loss. It's basically L1 far away and it's sort of L2 nearby. And that presents, uh, sometimes that's called a, a Huber loss. Uh, some people call this also elastic uh, network because uh, this, um, an old paper from the 1980s or 1990s that, that kind of proposed this, this kind of objective function for a different purpose. Uh, <clears throat> so that's useful. Um, that was uh, advertised by Ross Gershik in the FATSAR CNN paper for, um, uh, and it's used quite a bit in computer vision for sort of various purposes. Again, it's for protecting against outliers. Um, also it, gives us sharper, it gives us also sharper results, you know, when we do like uh, image prediction. Sharper than? Using the MSC? Not particularly. I mean, it's, it, it's just like the MSC for small errors. Okay. So that doesn't make any difference, but it, it, mm. it doesn't... Um, or maybe I misunderstood what, what your point was. Alfredo. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to compare the L1 versus the, the L2. The, the L2 gives us like usually a blurry, uh, blurry predictions whenever we try to do a prediction by using like the uh, L2, minimizing the L2, whereas like people are minimizing the L1 in order to have like sharper uh, overall predictions. Okay, so if you, take, um, if you take a bunch of points, okay, if you take a bunch of Y values, okay, and you ask the question, uh, what value, so you take a bunch of points on, on Y, okay? And you, and you ask the question, what value of Y minimizes the square loss? The answer is that it's the average of all the Y's, okay? Okay, so if you, so if for a single X, you have a whole bunch of Y's, which means you have noise in your data, uh, your system will want to produce the average of all the Y's that you're observing, okay? And if the y you're observing is not a single value, but is, I don't know, an image, the average of a bunch of images is a blurry image. Okay, that's why you get those blurry effects. Now, with L1, the value of y that minimizes the L1 norm, the L1 distance, so basically the sum of the absolute values of the differences between the value you're considering and all the points, all the y points, that's the median. Okay, so it's, it's a, a given, uh, point. All right. Uh huh. And I see. The median, of course, uh, is not blurry. The median yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the image is not blurry. It's, a, it's just an image. Although it's kind of difficult to define in multiple dimensions. But um, um, so one problem with this loss is that it has a scale, right? Uh, so here the transition here is is at 0.5, but why should it be at 0.5? You know, it could be. It depends. What the scale of your of your errors uh, are. Okay, uh, negative log likelihood loss. This is really not the negative log likelihood loss. I'm not sure why it's called this way in PyTorch, but basically, uh, here imagine that you have uh, an x vector coming out. Okay, and your your loss function is there is one correct x. Okay, so imagine each x corresponds to a score. Uh, for let's like, say multi-class classification, right? So you have a desired class, which is one particular index in that vector, okay? And what you want is you want to make that score as large as possible, okay? If those scores are likelihoods, then this is uh, minimum negative log likelihood. If, if those scores are log likelihoods, 
then this is maximum likelihood or minimum negative log likelihood. Okay, but there is nothing in this module that actually specifies that the else have to be log likelihoods. So this is just, you know, make my desired uh, component as large as possible. That's it. Um, if you put negative signs in front, uh, so now you, you can interpret the X's as energies as opposed to scores. Okay, they're not positive scores. They're like, they're like penalties, if you want. Um, but it's, uh, it's the same. So the formula here says, you know, just pick the X that happens to be the correct one uh, for one sample in the batch and make that score as large as possible. Now, uh, this particular one allows you uh, to give a, a different weight to different, uh, to, uh, different categories, which is those, w, uh, those Ws. It's a, it's a weight vector that gives a weight to each of the each of the categories. It's useful in a lot of uh, cases, particularly if you have uh, widely uh, different uh, um, frequencies for the for the categories. You might want to increase the weight of uh, samples for which you have uh, a small number of uh, of uh, examples. Uh, I mean, for categories for which you have a small number of samples. However, I'm actually not uh, a big fan of this. Of this. I think it's a much better idea to just uh, increase the the frequency of the of the samples from the class from the class that have you know that appears rarely, so that you equalize the frequency the frequencies of the classes when you train. Um, uh, it's much better because uh, it, it exploits stochastic gradient in a better way. Okay, so uh, so the bottom line of that is. If you have, uh, let me actually uh, draw a picture of this. So uh, let's say you have a problem where you have tons of samples for category one, and then a small number of samples for category two, and a tiny number of samples for category three. Uh, you could, uh, so let's say, you know, here you have, I don't know, a thousand samples, and here you have 500 samples, and here you have, I don't know, 200 samples, right? So what you could do is uh, using this uh, this kind of uh, weight function, you could give this uh, a weight of uh, of uh, one, and this guy a weight of two, and this guy a weight of five, and then you can equalize the weights if you want. Uh, it's probably better to make sure that the weights normalize to one. That would be probably be a better idea. But what I recommend is not that. What I recommend is um, when you pick your your samples. Uh, you basically pick one sample from class one and then one sample from class two, one sample from class three. And then, you know, you keep doing this during your training uh, session. And when you get to the end of class three, you go back to the beginning. Okay. So you keep going here, but here you go back to the first sample. Keep going here, go back, and now you're on the second sample. Okay. And now you get to the end of... Uh, of class two, go back to the start, okay? So the next sample is gonna be here, here, and here, and then the next one here, here, and here, 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 and then this guy wraps around again, uh, et cetera, right? So you basically have equal probability, equal frequencies for all the categories by just going through those kind of circular uh, buffers um, um, uh, more often for categories for which you have fewer samples. Okay. One thing you should absolutely never do is uh, equalize the frequencies by by just not using all the samples in categories that are frequent. I mean, that's horrible. You should never let any data on the floor. There's never any reason to leave data on the floor. Okay. Um, now, here's a problem with this. The problem with this is that after you've trained your, your neural net to do this, your neural net does not know about the relative uh, likelihood, the relative frequencies of the samples. And so let's say this is a system that does medical diagnosis. It doesn't know that uh, the common cold is way, way more frequent than, uh, uh, you know, lung cancer or something, right? So um, what you need to do in the end is do a, a, a pass, a few passes perhaps, where you kind of fine tune your system so that uh, w with the actual frequencies of the categories. And the effect of this is going to be for the system to adapt the biases at the output layer so that uh, the likelihood of uh, 
you know, uh, a diagnosis corresponds to the, the, the frequency of it, right? It's gonna favor things that are more frequent. The reason why you don't want to do this during the entire training is because um, if you train a multi-layer net, the, 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 the system basically never develops the right features for rare cases. And I may have spoke, spoken about this already in the class uh, in, in, in past weeks. Um, um, to, to kind of recycle the example of medical school, uh, you, you don't spend, when you go to medical school, you don't spend uh, time studying the flu that is proportional to the frequency of the flu with respect to very rare diseases, for example, right? Uh, you spend basically the same time studying all the diseases. In fact, you spend more time studying complicated ones, which usually tend to be rare. Uh, and uh, that's because you need to develop the features for it, okay? And then you need to kind of correct for the fact that, you know, those rare diseases are, are, are rare. Um, so you don't do the, you know, you don't uh, uh, suspect the, the diagnosis um, for rare diseases very often because, you know, it's rare. Okay. So that's all for, for weights. Um, cross entropy loss. So you've been using this a lot, of course. And cross entropy loss is a, a kind of merging of two things. A merging of a log softmax function and a negative log likelihood loss. Okay, and so, and the reason why you want to have this is is for numerical reasons. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the log softmax is you know basically a softmax followed by a log, right? So uh, you first compute the softmax, then you do the log. If you do softmax and then log, and you backpropagate through this, you might have. Uh, gradients in the middle between the log and the softmax that end up being infinite. Um, so for example, if, uh, if the, the maximum value of one of the softmax is close to one, uh, uh, and some of the other ones are close to zero, you take the log, you get something that's close to minus infinity. You backpropagate through the log, you get something that's close to infinity. Okay, because the, the um, uh, slope of log goes to zero is very, very close to infinity. But now you multiply this by a softmax that is saturated. So it's multiplied by something that's very close to zero. So in the end, you get a reasonable number. But because the intermediate numbers are close to infinity or zero, you multiply plus you know, something that's close to plus infinity by something that's close to zero, you get numerical issues. So you don't want to separate log and softmax. You want to do log softmax in one, in one go. It simplifies the formula. It makes the whole thing uh, much more stable numerically. Um, and for similar reasons, you also want to uh, uh, merge log softmax and negative log likelihood loss. So, so basically, if you have log softmax and negative log likelihood loss, it says, I got a bunch of weighted sums, I'm gonna pass them to a softmax, I'm gonna take the log of those, and then I, I want to make the, the output of the log softmax for the correct class as large as possible. Okay, that's what the negative log likelihood loss does. It wants to make the score of the correct class as large as possible. We, we saw that just a minute ago, right? Um, when you backpropagate through the log softmax, it, as a consequence, it's gonna make the score of all the other classes as small as possible, right? Because of the normalization. Um, and so that, you know, that's why sometimes the, the whole idea of sort of uh, building a, uh, a network by you know, modules, sometimes there is an advantage in sort of merging the modules into a single one by hand. Um, right, so, <clears throat> so the cross entropy loss, in fact, uh, this explains a little bit, you know, those uh, uh, numerical uh, simplifications. So uh, the loss, uh, you know, takes a, an X factor and a, a category, a desired category, a class, okay? And uh, computes the negative log of the softmax applied to the vector of scores. But the one that's uh, <clears throat> uh, on, the, on the numerator numerator here is the the X of the index of the correct class, okay? So that's that's your loss, the negative log of exponential, the score of the correct class divided by the sum of the exponentials of all the scores. Okay, uh, you can think of the X's as negative energies. Okay, um, it's completely equivalent. Now, when you do the, 
the math and you simplify, you, the log and the exponentials kind of simplify. And so you just get the score of the correct class, the negative score of the correct class, okay? So to make that small, you make the score large. And then plus the log of the sum of the exponentials of the scores of all the other class, to make that small, uh, you make all the XJs uh, small, negative, as, as far as, fa you know, as negative as possible, okay? So this will make the score of the correct class large, make the score of everything else small. Uh, again, like in the NLL, you can, you can have a weight uh, per category. Also, there is a physical interpretation, right, of the cross entropy. Right, okay, so um, why is it called cross entropy? Because it is the cross entropy between two distributions. It's the KL divergence really between two distributions. Uh, it, it doesn't appear clearly here in this formula, but think of the softmax applied to the X vector as a distribution, okay? So we'll take the X vectors, the, the scores, run them to a softmax, you get a bunch of numbers between zero and one that's on to one. Um, and now you have a desired distribution and the desired distribution uh, the target distribution, if you want, is one in which all the uh, wrong categories have zero and the correct category has one, okay? Now compute the KL divergence between those two distributions, okay? So it's the sum over indices of the correct probability, okay? Uh, which is zero for, except for one term, uh, times the ratio between the log of the the, the probability that the system produces and the correct probability, which is one, okay? So all of those terms, um, you know, reduce to kind of a single term, which is just the one for which the correct probability term is one, okay? So we end up with this, with this term. It's just a neg negative log of the softmax output for the correct class, okay? We can view this as a cross entropy between the distribution produced by the system and the the one hot vector corresponding to the desired distribution, if you want. Okay, so now there is, uh, there would be another kind of more sophisticated version of this, which would be the actual KL divergence between the distribution produced by the system and a distribution that you propose, whatever it is, a target distribution, which now is not binary, it's not a one hot vector anymore, but it's just a, a vector of numbers. And that's called the KL divergence loss. In fact, it's, uh, we'll see it in a minute. Uh, so KL divergence is a kind of, you know, it's not a distance because it's not symmetric, but it's, a, it's sort of a divergence between, um, uh, between distributions, discrete distributions. Okay, so this one is a, a bit of a, a kind of an extension, if you want, of uh, 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 log softmax. Um, <clears throat> and it's a version of it that is applicable for very, very large uh, a categorization. So if you have many, many, many categories, uh, what you might want to do is kind of uh, cut some corners. You don't want to compute a, a giant softmax over say a million categories or maybe even more. Um, so there you can sort of basically ignore the ones that are small and, you know, kind of use tricks to kind of, uh, 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 you know, improve the, the speed of the, of the computation, and this is what this does. I'm not gonna go into the details of exactly what it does, because actually I don't know the details, but, um, but it's basically an efficient approximation of softmax for a very, very large number of categories. Um, so this is a special case of cross entropy when you only have two categories. And in that case, it kind of reduces to something simple um, so this does not include softmax. This is just a, a cross entropy when you have two categories. And uh, as I as I said before, the the the, the cross entropy loss is uh, the sum over categories of the uh, probability. Uh, I mean, sum over indices or sum over categories of the probability for the target the target probability for that category times the ratio between the log. Uh, of the um, the probability for of produced by the system divided by the probability uh, of the target category, and if you work it out for two categories, necessarily uh, one score is one minus the other one if you have two uh, exclusive categories, and uh, and it comes down to this. Okay, now uh, 
this uh, supposes that x and y is x and y are uh, kind of probabilities that have to be between, strictly between zero and one. I mean, not strictly, but well, kind of strictly because otherwise the logs kind of blow up. Uh, here is the KL divergence loss I was telling you about earlier. Um, so here it's the, um, I mean, it, it's, it's written here in a funny form, but it's basically the, um, here again, it's, it sort of assumes, uh, it, this is not the one I was telling you about earlier, actually. This one is also the simplified one when you have uh, a, uh, a, a one hot distribution uh, for the target. So Y is, uh, um, is, uh, is a category. <clears throat> But it has a disadvantage of not being merged with something like softmax or log softmax, so um, it it may reach. Uh, I mean, it, it may have kind of uh, numerical issues. Again, it assumes uh, x and y are, you know, distributions. Uh, this is barely used. Poisson loss. Um, okay, so uh, this version of uh, binary cross entropy here. Uh, takes scores that haven't gone through a sigmoid. So this one uh, does not assume that X, uh, the X's are between zero and one. Uh, it, it just takes you know, values, whatever they are, and it, 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 it passes them through a sigmoid to make sure they are between zero and one, strictly. Okay. And so that is more likely to be numerically stable. Uh, it's a bit the same idea as kind of merging log softmax and negative log likelihood. Uh, very, yeah, same thing here. That's what I was talking. Okay, margin losses. Um, so this is sort of an important category of losses. Uh, those losses basically say, um, if I have, in this case, two inputs, um, the loss function here says, I want uh, one input to be larger than the other one by at least a margin. Okay, so imagine the two inputs are scores for two categories. You want the score for the correct category to be larger than the score for the incorrect category by at least some margin that you pass uh, to the system. Um, and that's the, the formula you see down there. So it's basically a hinge, okay? And it takes the difference between the two scores. And so Y is a binary variable, it's plus one or minus one, and it controls whether you want X to be larger than, X1 to be larger than X2 or whether you want x2 to be larger than x1, okay? But you basically give it two scores and you tell it which one you want to be the larger score. Um, and then the, the cost function says, you know, if, if this one is larger than that one by at least a margin, then the cost is zero. If it's, if, uh, if it's smaller than the margin or if it's in the other direction, then the cost increases linearly, okay? So that's called a hinge loss, okay? Um, <clears throat> So that's very useful for a number of different things. Um, we've, we've seen an example of this in, um, uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, for example, uh, so this is sort of a, a margin ranking loss. So you have two values, but um, th there are sort of, there's a simplified version of it. I mean, there's a sim simpler version of it, which I don't have here for some reason. Uh, we only have an X, okay? So basically the loss is max of zero uh, and uh, uh, minus X times a margin. And it just wants to make, to make X uh, smaller than the margin, right? And so this is sort of a, a special case where you have a ranking between two scores of two categories. So here is how you would use this for classification. You would uh, basically run your classifier. You would get uh, scores, okay? At the, so before you do any nonlinearity, weighted sums. And then you know the correct category. So you say, I want this correct category to have a high score. And then what you do is you take another category that has the most offending uh, score. So either another category, so a category that is incorrect, that has a higher score than the correct one, or that has a lower score, but the lower score is too close, okay? So you take the, the category that, whose score is the closest to the, uh, to the correct one, or whose score is um, higher than the correct one, 
And you feed the, those two scores to a loss function like this. Uh, so basically, it's going to push up the score of the correct category, push down the score of the incorrect category until the difference is at least the margin, equal to the margin. Okay? Um, and that's, you know, a perfectly good way of uh, uh, training something. In the context of an energy-based model, for example, that's, that's one of the things you might want to do. You might want to say uh, X1 or minus X1 is the energy... I mean, X, you know, minus X1 would be the energy of the correct answer, and minus X2 would be the energy of the incorrect answer, like an, uh, a contrastive uh, term, an incorrect answer. And you want to push down the energy of the correct answer, push up the energy of incorrect answer, so that the difference is at least some margin. Okay. You can use this kind of loss for that. Uh, the triplet loss is kind of a refinement on this. So this is used a lot for... Uh, uh, metric learning for the kind of Siamese nets that uh, Ishan was uh, Ishan Mitzra was talking about uh, last week, and and there the idea is let's say I have um, a uh, <clears throat> a distance so let's say I have three samples I have uh, one sample and another sample that's very similar to it I run them through two convolutional nets I get two vectors I compute the distance between those two vectors uh, d of a i p i for example okay. Um, I want to make this distance as small as possible because that's a correct sample. And then I take two samples that I know are semantically different, okay, the image of a cat and one of a table, and I want to make the vectors far away from each other. So I compute the distance and I want to make this uh, distance large. All right. Now, um, I can insist that the first distance be zero, and I can insist that the second distance be larger than the margin. That would be kind of a margin loss type, uh, type thing. But what I can do is one of those uh, triplet margin loss where I say, the only thing I care about is that the distance that I get for the good pair is smaller than the distance that I get for the bad pair. I don't care if the distance is small. I just want it to be smaller than the distance for the bad pair. Okay. Uh, and that's what those ranking laws do. Um, a bunch of those were, uh, uh, I mean, the, one of the first, I think, that was proposed was by uh, uh, Chisholm Weston and Sammy Benjo back when Chisholm Weston was still at Google. And they used this to train uh, kind of an image search uh, system for Google. So back then, I'm not sure it's true anymore, but back then you would type a query on Google. Google would encode that uh, query into a vector. Uh, then we compare this to a whole bunch of vectors de describing images that have been uh, previously uh, indexed. Uh, and uh, and then would kind of retrieve the images whose vector were close to the one that uh, that you had. And the way you train those those uh, the networks that compute those vectors in that case back then it was linear uh, linear networks actually uh, is you train them with those triplet loss. Okay, so you said good uh, hits for my search um, should should have a distance between the vectors that is smaller than any bad hit. And I don't care if the distance is small. I just want it to be smaller than for bad hits. Any question? That's kind of a, a graphical explanation of this, where P is a positive uh, sample. So it's uh, you know similar to A. So A is the sample you considered. P is kind of a positive uh, sample. And N is a negative sample or a contrastive sample. And you want to push N away and bring P closer. And as soon as uh, P is closer than N by some margin, you, you stop pushing and pulling. Um, you have soft versions of this, and in fact, you can think of NCE, the, the kind of loss function that Ishan was talking about, as kind of a soft version of that, where you basically, uh, you have a bunch of positives and a bunch of negatives, or you have one positive and a bunch of negatives, and you run them through a softmax, and you say, I want this, the, you know, e to the minus distance for the correct one to be uh, uh, smaller than uh you know, e to the minus the, the other one. So it kind of, um, you know, pushes the positive closer to you and pushes the other ones far, uh, further to you, but now with some sort of soft maxi top sort of exponential decay as opposed to sort of a hard margin. Um, so in PyTorch, you have things that allow you to have multi-labels. So this allows you to basically give multiple correct outputs. So instead of... Uh, 
uh, you know, this is a ranking loss, but instead of insisting that there is only one correct category and, you know, you, you, you want a high score for the correct category and a bad score for everything else, uh, here you can have a number of categories for which you want high scores, and then all the other ones will get pushed away. All right, we'll, we'll get their, their scores will be pushed down. Um, so here it's a, it's a hinge loss, but you do a sum of those, this hinge loss over all categories. Uh, and, uh, uh, and for each uh, category, if the category is a desired one, you push it up. If it's a non-desired one, you push it down, which is what the, the pseudo formula says. And of course you ha have the soft version of this, which I'm not gonna go, go into the details of. Uh, and the multi-margin uh, version of it. Um, <clears throat> so this pushing and pulling for uh, metric learning for embedding for Siamese nets that I was telling you about, um, uh, th it's actually kind of all implemented if you want in uh, one of those uh, hinge embedding loss. So hinge embedding loss is uh, a loss for Siamese nets that uh, kind of pushes things that are symmetrically similar to you and push away uh, things that are not, okay? So the Y variable indicates whether the pair you are, or whether the score you are giving to the system is one that should be pushed up or one that should be pushed down. And it uh, it chooses uh, a hinge loss that makes the score uh, positive uh, if uh, Y is plus one, and it makes the score uh, negative by some margin delta if, uh, if Y is minus one. Uh, very often when you are doing Siamese nets, the way you compute the similarity between two vectors is not through a Euclidean distance, but through a cosine distance. Uh, so it'd be one minus the cosine between the, uh, the, of the angle between the two vectors. This is basically a normalized Euclidean distance, if you want. You can think of it this way. Um, the advantage of this is that whenever you kind of push the distance, uh, whenever you have two vectors and you want to make the distance as large as possible, there's a very easy way for the system to get away with it by making the, the two vectors very large, very long, you know, not pointing in the same direction and make them very, very long. So now the distance will be large. Uh, but of course, that's not what you want. You don't want the system to just make the, the vectors bigger. You, you want it to actually rotate the vector in the right direction. So you, you normalize the vectors and then compute a normalized Euclidean distance. And that's basically what this does. And what this does is that it, uh, for positive cases, it tries to make the vectors as aligned with each other as possible. And for negative uh, pairs, it tries to make the cosine uh, smaller than the particular margin. The margin in that case would par should probably be something that kind of uh, is, is close to zero. Uh, so you want the, the cosine um, in, a, in a high dimensional space, there's a lot of uh, space near the equator of the sphere, of the high dimensional sphere, okay? So all your points now are normalized on the sphere. And what you want is uh, samples that are symmetrically similar to you should be close to you. The samples that are dissimilar should be orthogonal. You don't want them to be oppo opposed because there is only one point in the South Pole. Whereas on the equator, there's a very, very high, large space, the entire sphere minus one dimension, basically. Okay. Um, so you can make the margin just, you know, some small, some small positive value, and, and then you get the entire equator essentially of the sphere, which contains the, almost the entire volume of the sphere in high dimension. Um, CTC loss, this is a little more complicated because that's uh, a loss that is uh, basically uses um, structure prediction, what's called structure prediction. So this is, uh, I, I sort of briefly talked about it uh, very quickly uh, a few weeks ago on something very similar to this. So this is um, a loss that is applicable when you, your output is a sequence of vectors of scores, uh, where the vectors correspond to scores of categories, okay? And so you have, so your system computes a vector of such scores. So imagine, for example, a speech recognition system. Speech recognition system, every 10 milliseconds, gives you a vector of probabilities for what the sound being pronounced right now is. And the number of categories usually is quite large on the order of a few thousand. Okay, so it gives you basically a softmax vector of a size, you know, typically 3000, let's say. One of those uh, every 10 milliseconds, all right? 
And what you like, you know, you have a desired output and the desired output is what word was being pronounced and a word that's being pronounced that corresponds to kind of a particular sequence of, uh, of sounds, if you want, that, that you, might, you might know. So what you need now is a cost that basically is low if that sequence looks like, like that sequence. But what you might allow is uh, uh, for the input sequence to uh, repeat some of the sounds, if you want, right? So, um, so for example, you know, my, uh, my cost to, to my, the, the target might be uh, the word seven, let's say, and it's pronounced really quickly, seven. So you basically have, you know, a very small number of samples of each sound in the sequence. But then perhaps the, the person who is pronouncing the, the word now that you use a, as a training sample pronounced it very slowly, like seven, right? So now the, the, first, the first uh, uh takes you know, several, several frames of 10 milliseconds that should all be mapped to the, the same um, uh, instance of, uh, of the uh in the, in the output. And I drew that picture before, but I'm gonna draw it again. Right, so the you have um, let's see, uh, you have a sequence of scores coming out of softmaxes. Let's say it's actually better if there are energies, but for CTC they need to be. And then you have the target sequence, and I think of this as some sort of matrix and each uh, entry in that matrix basically measures the distance between the, the two vectors that are here, okay? So one entry in the matrix indicates how this vector looks like that vector. For example, with the cross entropy or something like that, okay? Or squared error. It doesn't matter what the loss function is. Um, so now, um, if this is the word, uh, seven pronounced slowly, okay? And this has perhaps only one uh, instance of each sound. Uh, you want all of those, uh, you know, you would want all of those vectors uh, corresponding to the E to be mapped to that E vector here. Okay, so you want to compute that cost of you know confusing that the those all of those I mean map, matching those e's to that to that e. Now of course here the system produced the correct answer, so you don't have much of a problem. But if the target is seven, but the word that was pronounced here, um, uh, or the output that was produced by the system uh, does not correspond to seven. Uh, that's 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 when you run into into trouble. So here, what you do is you find the best mapping from uh, the input sequence to the output sequence. Okay, so the S gets mapped to the S, the E to the E, the V to the V, the E's to the E, and the N to the to the N. So you get this kind of path, if you want. That think of this as a path in a graph. Um, and the way you determine this is basically by using a dynamic programming algorithm, a shortcut path algorithm that figures out how do I get from here to here uh, in a path that minimizes the sum of the distance, distances between uh, the, the, all the vectors, all the distances between the vectors of you know, all the points I'm going through, okay? So there's a optimization with respect to a latent variable if you want, okay? And CTC basically does that for you, right? So you give it two sequences and it computes the distance between them and uh, you know, kind of the best kind of mapping between the two by allowing uh, 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 basically to, to map multiple um, uh, input vectors to kind of a, a single one on the output. It cannot expand, it, it can only kind of reduce if you want. Um, and then that's done in a way that you can back propagate right into it. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, to more things like this at the end, if we can. Oops. So this is what this, uh, the target is assumed to be many to one. Um, the, the alignment of the input to the target is assumed to be many to one, which means the length of the target sequence, such that it must be smaller than the length of the input. That's for the reason I just explained. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's basically differentiable time warping. You could think of it this way. Or sort of a, a module that does dynamic time warping or uh, dynamic programming and is still differentiable. The idea for this goes back in the early 90s in uh, Leon Botou's PhD thesis, actually. That's very old. Is there a, um, a good paper or resource to learn more about that dynamic programming algorithm there that you're Yeah, using? actually, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I may not have time to go through it, but I'll try to. Okay, cool. Uh, but basically, the last part of the energy based model tutorial. Okay, so the energy, energy based model tutorial, the 2006 paper that um, we gave you um, a reference, uh, a link to, uh, a tutorial on energy based models. The, the, the second part is, is all about uh, this kind of stuff, essentially. Um, okay, so it's more energy based models, but now in kind of more of the supervised context, if you want. Um, so, uh, preliminary, so before I get to this, uh, I want to come back to um, uh, the sort of the more general formulation of energy based models. And the uh, idea that, so if you want to kind of define energy based models in the uh, proper way, these are the, the conditional versions. Uh, you have a, a training set, a bunch of pairs, x, y, y, i for i equals 1 to p. You have a loss functional. So the loss functional, L of uh, E and S. So it takes the energy function computed by the system, okay, and the training set, and it gives you a, a scalar value. Now, you can, you can think of this as a functional. So a functional is a function of a function, okay? But in fact, because the energy function itself is parameterized by uh, parameter W, you can turn this loss functional into a loss function, which is not just a function of W, not a function of the energy function, okay? Um, and of course, the, the set of energy functions is, is called epsilon here. It's parameterized by uh, the parameter W, which is taken within the set. So training consists in, of course, minimizing uh, the, the loss functional with respect to W and finding the W that minimizes it. And, and so one question you might ask yourself, you know, I, I went through a whole bunch of objective function, loss functions here. And the question is, if you are in an energy-based framework, what loss functions are good ones and what loss functions are bad ones? How do you characterize a loss function that actually will do something useful for you? Okay. Um, so here is a general formulation of a loss function. It's, uh, it's an average over training samples. Uh, so here I'm kind of assuming that it's invariant under permutation of the samples. So an average is as good as any other aggregation, aggregating function. So it's the average over training samples of a per sample loss function, uh, capital L. And it takes the desired answer, y, which could be just a category or it could be a, a whole uh, image or whatever. And it takes the uh, energy function where x, the x variable xi is, is equal to xi, the ice uh, training sample. Uh, but the y variable is undetermined, okay? So E of w, uh, y, and xi is basically the entire shape of the energy function for all, for all values of y, over values of y for a given x. Okay, for x equal to xi. And you can have a regularizer if you want. Okay, so here this is a loss functional again. And again, of course, uh, we have to design this loss functional so that it makes the energy of correct answers small and the energy of incorrect answers uh, large in some ways, right? Um, okay, now we're gonna go through a bunch of uh, different types of loss functions. So, one thing we could do is say my loss function is just going to be the energy of the correct answer. So I'm going to place myself in the context of an energy-based model. Uh, my system produces scores. I interpret those scores as energies. So high is bad, good is good. I mean, low is good, um, as opposed to positive scores. Um, and what I'm just going to do is uh, uh, define my energy functional as a function of the energy function of the function of y as simply the energy that my model gives to the correct answer, okay? So basically I give it an x uh, and I give it the correct answer y and I ask the system what energy do you give to that pair? And then I try to make the, that energy as small as possible, 
Okay, so you have this uh, landscape of energies here. Now we are in a, I showed you this slide in the context of unsupervised self-supervised learning. Here I'm showing to you in the context of supervised learning. So imagine that one of the variables is X and the other variable is Y, okay? And the blue beads are training samples and you want to make the energy of the blue beads as small as possible. Um, so you're pulling down on the blue beads, but you're not doing anything else. And so as a result, depending on the architecture of your network, if your network is not designed properly, or if it's designed in, a, in no particular way, um, it could very well be that the energy function is gonna become flat everywhere, okay? You're just trying to make the energy of the correct answer small, and you're not telling the system the energy of everything else should be higher. And so the system might just collapse, all right? Um, so energy loss is not good in that sense, but there are certain situations where it's applicable because um, if the shape of the energy function is such that it cannot make the, it can only make the energy of a single answer small, all the other ones being, lo being larger, then you don't need to have a contrastive term. Okay, and we've seen this in the context of self-supervised learning. People are completely lost about the loss functional. Right, okay. Um, so there's a function L and it's a function of another function E, okay? Uh, so it's called a functional because it's a function of a function, right? It's not a function of a point, it's a function of a function. Now, if that second function uh, is parameterized by parameter w, then you can say that the loss function is actually a function of that parameter w and now it, it becomes a regular function, okay? That's what I had in the... Can you, can you write it down? Uh, it's basically written here. Okay, oh. you can either write the functional as... Uh, if I can find my, as L of E and S. So that's a functional because it's a function of E, which itself is a function, okay? But E itself uh, is a function of W. And so if I write the loss function directly as a function of W, now it's just a regular function. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I asked the question that was asked in the chat. I, yeah, yeah, I, no, I understand. Kind of knew. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Before the, you know, for... Okay, we've seen the negative log likelihood loss uh, uh, before. I, I talked about this. So this is a, a loss function that... Uh, tries to make the energy of the correct answer. So look at the, the rectangle in red, tries to make the energy of the correct answer as low as possible. And then you have the second term, one over beta log sum over all y's of e to the minus beta e of wyx. Um, and this one is trying to make the energy of all y's for this given x as large as possible. Okay, because the best way to make this term uh, small is to make those energies large because they enter uh, in there as a negative of uh, negative exponential. Okay, so this has this kind of pushing down on the correct answer, pushing up on incorrect answer behavior. Um, and we've seen before, we just talked about margin loss and, and other types of losses. Uh, uh, here is something that's called a perceptron loss because it's basically very similar to, I mean, it's exactly the same as the loss that, we, that was used for the, percep the, the perceptron 60 years ago, over 60 years ago. So this one says, I want to make the energy of the correct answer small. Uh, and at the same time, I want to make the energy of the smallest, uh, uh, the smallest energy for all answers as large as possible. Okay, so pick the Y that has the smallest energy in your system, make that as large as you can. At the same time, pick the correct energy, make that as small as you can. Now there is a point at which the uh, uh, answer with the correct energy is gonna be equal to the correct answer. And so that difference can never be negative, okay? Because the first term is necessarily one term in that minimum. And so the difference is at best zero and for uh, every other case is, 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 is positive. It's only zero when the system gives you the correct answer, okay? But this 
objective function does not prevent the system from giving the very same energy to every answer. Okay, so in that sense, it's a bad energy. It's a bad loss function. It's a bad loss function because it it says I want the energy of the correct answer to be small. I want the energy of all the other answers to be large, but I don't insist that there is any difference between them. So the system can choose to make every answer the same energy. Uh, and that's a collapse. Okay, so perceptual loss is not good. It's actually only good for linear systems, but it's not good for, as, as an objective function for nonlinear systems. Um, so here's a way to design an objective function that will always be good. And you, you take the energy of the correct answer and you take the energy of the most offending incorrect answer, which means uh, the value of y that is incorrect, but at the same time is the lowest energy of all the incorrect answers. Okay, and your system will work if that difference is negative. In other words, if the energy of the correct answer is smaller than the energy of the most offending incorrect answer, by at least some quantity, some margin. Okay, so as long as your objective function when you design it ensures that the energy of the correct answer is smaller than the energy of the most offending incorrect answer by at least some margin, non-zero margin, then you're fine. Your loss function, uh, is good. Okay, so things like hinge loss are good. The hinge loss basically says, um, and we talked about this just, just before, I want the energy of the correct answer to be smaller than the energy of the most offending incorrect answer, which is denoted y i bar here, by at least m. Okay, this is what this loss function does. It's a hinge loss, and it, it wants to push down the energy of this guy below the energy of that guy by at least this margin. Um, so this has a margin M and this will, you know, if you train a system with this loss, it will, and it can learn the task, it will learn the task and probably produce the good answers. Uh, the hinge loss, uh, the soft hinge loss, which uh, is in the context of energy-based models is expressed this way. Basically, instead of feeding the difference between the energies of the correct answer and the most offending incorrect one into a hinge, it fit, it fit, it feeds it to a, a soft hinge, okay, which we talked about um, just a few minutes ago. And there, this one also has be, a margin. The margin the question is would be how, how to Say pick again? M. Say again? The question would be how to pick M. Um, it's arbitrary. Uh, you can set M to one. Uh, you can set M to one tenth. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary because it will just determine the size of the weights of, the, of your last layer. That's all it does, okay. So it's basically up to you. Uh, yeah, so the soft hinge loss uh, has an infinite margin. It wants the difference between those two energies to be infinite, but the, the slope sort of decreases exponentially. So it's, it's never going to get there because, you know, um, the gradients get very small as the difference increases. Um, Here's another example of uh, a margin loss, uh, the square loss, the, the, square, the, the, square, the square square loss, okay? So this is a, a, a loss that tries to make the energy of the correct answer squared as small as possible. And then it has a square hinge to push away, to push up the energy of the most offending incorrect answer. Okay, and again, that works. Um, and this is very similar to the kind of loss that people use inside these nets and stuff like that, that uh, you've, you've heard about. Um, there's a whole menagerie of such losses, which I'm not going to go through. Um, there's actually a, a whole table here, which is also in this paper, the tutorial on energy-based models. And what's indicated on the, on the right side is whether they have a margin or not. So the energy loss does not have a margin. It doesn't push up anything, so no margin. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work always. You have to design the machine so that this loss may work for that, that system. The perception loss, uh, does not work in general. It only works, it works if you have a linear parameterization of your energy uh, as a function of the parameters, but that's a special case and that's the case for the perceptron. Um, and then uh, some of them have a finite margin like the hinge loss and some of them have an infinite margin like the, the log, uh, um, the, the sort of soft hinge if you want. Um, and there's a, you know, a, whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of those losses. Some of those were used, uh, were invented in the context of uh, discriminative learning for speech recognition systems. 
but um, not not they were invented before people in machine learning actually got interested in this. Uh, the question, question would be like how how you find the y bar. So if you have like a discrete code, we can find simply like you know uh, the minimum value. But otherwise, are we running gradient descent? Um, right. So if y is continuous, then uh, there is no kind of clear definition for what is the most offending incorrect answer. Okay, you would have to define some sort of uh, distance around the correct answer. Uh, above which you consider an answer to be incorrect. Okay, so for example, you are in a continuous uh, energy landscape. There's one, one training sample here. You want to make that, the energy of that training sample small, easy enough. Compute the energy through your neural net, push it down, back propagate, update the weight so that the energy goes down, easy enough. Now the incorrect answer, if you, if you take an answer that's just kind of epsilon outside of that, uh, and you push up, you know, your energy surface might be a little stiff because it's comp computed by a parameterized neural net, so that may not be possible. So you probably want to have a incorrect answer that's, you know, quite a bit outside that you're gonna you're gonna push up. Um, and so that's how you define, you know, the, the the whole question is how you define a contrastive sample that you're gonna push up. And and the a lot of those objective functions here, those loss functions use a, a single, uh, uh, you know, Y bar, uh, negative sample, but uh, there is no single, simple, single correct way of pe picking this uh, Y bar. You can imagine, um, you know, particularly in the kind of, in the sort of uh, continuous case or in the case where uh, Y is either very, very um, uh, large or, or continuous and high dimensional, uh, there's no simple way to pick uh, to pick y bar. You know, a, a lot of discussions we've had about contrastive methods that Ishan talked about uh, for Siamese nets and that we talked about before, uh, where basically how do you pick a y bar in the uh, uh, self-supervised case? So self-supervised, you don't have an x, right? Uh, and you know, there's many ways you can you can pick it up. Um, it's only obvious how to pick it up in kind of small cases. Um, I just want to point out uh, the formula here at the bottom. So this is a kind of, uh, you can think of this as sort of a general form of, uh, of uh, sort of hinge type uh, uh, contrastive losses where uh, you have an H function here. Think of it as a, as a hinge of some type, okay? And inside of that hinge, you have uh, the energy of the correct answer, so that's the energy of uh, WYIXI, so this is your training sample, that's the energy your system gives to the training sample. The second term is uh, the energy of some other answer, Y, okay, uh, for the same X uh, training sample. And then there is a margin, but that margin C is actually a function of YI and Y, and you might imagine the margin is actually also a function of X and XI. Um, so basically, you determine a margin as a function of the distance between the between the y's, okay? And you feed that to, let's say, a hinge. Now the thing is, uh, this loss function is summed over all y's. Here is a discrete sum because y is discrete, but you could imagine an integral, okay? So this kind of loss says, um, you know, I I have an energy for my correct answer. I have energies for every other answer in my space. And I want to push up the energy of all other answers, uh, but the amount by which I want to make them higher, the margin, depends on the distance between uh, between y and y, uh, y bar. Or in this case, between yi, which is this, and y, which is the other, uh, the otherwise. Okay, so you can imagine that this margin will, you know, become smaller and smaller as the two y's kind of get closer to each other. In this case, you don't push up too much for things that are too close and you, you push up in proportion to the distance of, uh, of the y, you know, whatever distance you, you think is appropriate. Uh, this is of course a more difficult uh, uh, loss function to, uh, to optimize. Um, I'm out of time, so I might talk about the structural prediction issue that I said I was gonna talk about at a later time. Uh, any more questions?
Um, the contrastive methods used for the self-supervised learning papers uh, are us usually um, take random uh, um, take random images to, as the negative examples. Do you have any idea if they use these functions? Anyone tried experimented with these? Did they use what kind of function? Um, these loss functions that you explained to us now. So most most of them use the basically the negative low likelihood loss here, which in this panel is called NLL MMI. Okay, so NCE that you you heard about from Ishan, that's what yeah. they use, right? They're trying to make the distance between the samples as small as possible, and then the contrastive term uh, is you know it's basically a log softmax of the distances. So when you compute the log softmax. Uh, you think of distance of a distance as an energy, and then you compute yeah. the log softmax of those energies. Uh, you get this formula here uh, uh, in the second last line called NLL MMI. Okay, MMI so the integral is approximated by taking random images. A random what? Um, they take random images as negative examples, so that is used to approximate the integral. Well, so basically, you can't compute this uh, integral over all y. So, uh, or this uh, sum if uh, y is discrete. And so you basically approximate the sum by, uh, you know, uh, a few terms that you pick randomly, right? Yeah. That's called Monte Carlo. I mean, basically, if you want to do this properly, you have to pick those samples uh, according to the rule of uh, Monte Carlo sampling. But it doesn't matter. I mean, that's, that's why hard negative mining is hard, okay? Yeah. That's why. What makes the difference between MoCo, Perl, SimClear, et cetera, is how you pick those negative samples. That's why I said there is no kind of, in, in cases where uh, the white space is, is high dimensional, there's, there's no you know, predefined way of picking negative samples, essentially. It's only in classification that it's easy. But has, have um, other people experimented with the other losses? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, a lot of people are using the square square or the, the, the sort of hinge, uh, you know, with the difference of, of energies. So some of the systems are used by, um, at least at some point, the, the system that uh, DeepFace, which is the, the face recognition system that used by Facebook to, to tag people, uh, it, it used a convolutional net uh, trained uh, in supervised mode with a certain number of uh, uh, categories, basically images from, I don't know, a million people or something. Uh, but then there was a, a fine tuning phase that used metric learning, uh, basically Siamese nets where you show two uh, photos of the same person and you say those are the same person and then two photos of different people and you push them apart. And that used, uh, they, they tried different objective functions, but I think they were using the square square loss uh, at some point, maybe the square exponential. I'm not entirely sure what they're using now, but you know, it's one of those. Uh, professor, what topics will you cover in the next lecture? Um, okay, so we're gonna have uh, two guest lectures. So next week is Michael Lewis. Uh, Michael Lewis is a uh, research scientist at uh, Facebook Air Research in uh, Seattle. And he is a, a specialist of natural language processing and translation. So he's gonna, you know, tell you all the interesting tidbits about uh, sequence to sequence, about transformers, about NLP and about translation, okay? Uh, and, you know, he knows a lot, you know, much better the details about this than I do. So he's the right person to talk about this. Uh, we're gonna have another guest lecture. It's gonna be Xavier Bresson. He, he's, uh, you know, one of the world specialists of uh, graph neural nets and, um, um, so this is the, the whole idea of, you know, how do you apply neural nets? Uh, you know, you can think of an image as a function on a regular grid, okay? Every pixel is a location on a regular grid. You can think of an image as a function on that grid, okay? So a grid is, is a graph of a particular type, and an image is just a function on a graph. Uh, you can think of, I don't know, a, a, a video as, you know, a regular 3D grid where you have space and time. Uh, and, you know, most natural signals, you can think of them as uh, uh, functions on kind of regular graphs. Okay. What about the case where the function you're interested in is not on a, is not on a Euclidean graph, if you want. So let's imagine, for example, you take a, a photo with a panoramic camera, uh, 
a, ca a 360 camera, right? So it's a camera that basically takes a, a, a spherical image. Okay, so now your, your pixels live on the sphere. How do you compute a convolution on a sphere? Okay, um, so you want to run your convolutional net on this image that now lives on the sphere. Um, you can't use the standard ways of computing convolutions. Um, so you have to figure out how to compute convolutions on the sphere, right? So that's an example. Now, here's something a little more complicated. Uh, imagine now that um, you have a 3D scanner and you're capturing, uh, I don't know, a dancer, you know, someone kind of in front of a 3D scanner. Um, and that person has a particular pose, let's say like this, okay? And, um, and then you take a, another 3D picture uh, 3D data from another person, and that other person is, you know, in another pose. That person has a different body shape. Um, she's in a different body pose. Uh, and now what you want is uh, you want to be able to map one onto the other. You want to be able to say, like, you know, what is the hand in the first person? Where is, where is the hand in the second person? So what you have to do now is basically have a neural net that takes into account a 3D mesh that represents the geometry of a hand uh, and train it to tell you it's a hand so that when you apply it to the hand, it tells you it's a hand. When you apply it to the other parts of the body, it tells you it's something else. But the data you have is not an image. It's a 3D mesh, okay? The mesh may have different resolutions. The triangles may occur, occur at different places. So how you define your convolutions on a domain like this that is independent of the resolution of the mesh and only kind of depends on the shape so that you can classify a hand regardless of the orientation, the size, the, the conformation, uh, and the body shape of the person, you know, things like that, right? So uh, here's another example that's perhaps uh, more interesting. You, uh, you want to do, you want to train something like a, like a Siamese net, but you want to train the Siamese net to tell you whether one uh, molecule is going to stick to another molecule, right? So you give two molecules to your neural net and your neural net produces two vectors. If those two uh, molecules stick together, it gives you two vectors whose distance is small, okay? And if they don't stick together, then the distance is large, okay? So you can think of the distance as kind of the negative free energy of the binding, the binding energy of the two uh, uh, you know, the, the, two, uh, the two molecules, right? Uh, or, the, you know, the, the free energy, you know, minus the constant, if you want. So, um, so you would train this as a Siamese net, but then the problem is how you represent a molecule uh, to a network, knowing that it's the same network you're going to apply to this molecule and that molecule, and the two molecules don't have the same shape. They don't have the same length, they don't have the same number of atoms, they don't have the same, like how do you represent uh, a molecule? The best way to represent a molecule is as a graph. It's basically a graph whose structure changes with the molecule. And this graph is uh, uh, annotated by the identity of the atoms at, at each site, maybe by their location in 3D space or their relative location, maybe by the angle of the bonds uh, between two successive atoms. Uh, or the binding energy of that particular bond and things like this. So, um, so the best way to represent a molecule is by, by representing as a graph, basically. And there's, uh, here's another example, perhaps more relevant to something like Facebook. Um, let's, say, um, <clears throat> um, let's say I want to kind of infer, or, or let's say Amazon or something. I want to infer what type of uh, Let's, let's say I'm Amazon, right? And I have a customer and that customer has bought a whole bunch of, of different things. And that customer has commented a whole bunch of different things. I could think of kind of encoding this as a vector, but it would be a vector of, of uh, uh, variable size because you know people buy different numbers of things and stuff like that. So I would need to sort of find a way to aggregate that data so that everybody can be represented by the same fixed size vector. But what, what if instead I represent the, the person and all the, all the things that that person has bought and all the uh, you know, reviews that person has made, et cetera, as a graph, essentially. And then I represent what I feed to the neural net is the graph with values on the nodes and perhaps the arcs. Um, 
if I have a way of representing a graph so that I can connect a neural net independently of the shape of the graph, then I can do this kind of application. Uh, and so this is what graph neural nets are about. It's a very, very hot topic at the moment. It's extremely promising for a lot of applications, particularly in uh, biomedicine, you know, in chemistry, in material science, but also in uh, uh, social science uh, for social network analysis and, uh, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of applications. Uh, computer graphics, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So it's um, it's really cool. And Xavier is really one of the one of the experts on this topic. So I'm really happy that he accepted to give us a talk. It's not going to be easy for them uh, for him because he's in Singapore. So yeah, it's going to be fine in the morning for him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I'm giving a lecture in a couple of days uh, in uh, in Hong Kong. So it's the same thing for me. <laughs> I see. So actually, he's from uh, Nanyang Technologi Technological University. So oh, NUS, University. Right. So, and yeah, NTU, yeah. right? NTU, NTU, yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I was confused. Correct. All right. Uh, so that was it. Oh, sorry. There was one more question. Uh, yeah, th that was really interesting, Professor. Uh, I had one more question. I was reading this term called normalizing flows. Yeah. Uh, and I don't understand what they are. Could you just give some intuition? into why, why people are excited about it. <clears throat> right, uh, so normalizing flows, um, so it's not a technique that I have a lot of experience with, but you know, I've read the papers. Um, it's, uh, so it was uh, proposed by uh, Danilo Rezende and uh, uh, Shakir uh, Mohamed at uh, DeepMind a while ago and a while back, maybe five years ago or so. Uh, and it's a, basically a sort of a density uh, estimation method. So it's a little bit like, uh, like GANs. It has a bit of the same spirit as GANs. The, um, and it, it, get, it gets inspiration from uh, ICA, independent component analysis, uh, although it's not kind of explicit in the original paper. But here's the basic idea. The basic idea is uh, you want to train a neural net to transform a known distribution from which you can sample into a distribution that happens to be the distribution of your data. Okay, so let's imagine that you have a latent variable Z that you sample from a Gaussian distribution and you run it through a function or uniform distribution over a domain, okay? You run it through a function implemented by a neural net and you want to train this neural net so that the distribution you get at the output is the one you want that corresponds to your data, okay? Uh, and um, so the the... Uh, let me give you a very simple uh, example. So let's say, uh, let's say I have a variable Z and I have an observed variable Y and I sample my variable Z with a uniform distribution, okay? Between say zero and one, okay? And what I want on the output is, I don't know, um, say a Gaussian. It's kind of stupid to want a Gaussian, but it's say I want a Gaussian because I could sample from a Gaussian easily. Uh, so what I need to do is kind of transform this uh, uniform distribution into a Gaussian by a mapping. And the mapping is going to be a function like, uh, it's going to be a function, okay, zero is here. Kind of like this, if you want. Okay. And, and this is the inverse of the integral of the Gaussian distribution. Okay. So if I take the derivative of this function, okay, so now, now let, let me kind of draw this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a little difficult to, to see, but uh, if I map Okay, the, the derivative of this function here will indicate how much I stretch a little piece here into a piece here, right? So the larger the derivative, the more I stretch, right? If the slope here is one, then this piece of the distribution here is not gonna be stretched, it's gonna be kind of passed um, unchanged, okay? Uh, and the larger the, the, the slope, the more I stretch the distribution, uh, I stretch a little piece here, and therefore I kind of distribute the, all the samples that fall into this little uh, location here. I stretch them over a, a large uh, region, right? And so what I need to do is design this function in such a way that it stretches 
my input distribution so that that distribution get transformed into the output distribution I want, all right? So there is a formula that says, so in multi-dimension, it's a little more complicated than this, but it says that the, the distribution you're gonna get uh, uh, on Y is gonna be equal to the distribution that you started with in Z, multiplied by the inverse of the determinant of the Jacobian of this F function, so this is F. Uh, Uh, minus one. So it's um, actually the original formula is this one, but those two things are equal, okay? So if you take, so this is for a multidimensional vector function, right? So it has a Jacobian to map uh, Z to Y. And so if you take the determinant of the inverse Jacobian, uh, of that function, uh, which is a scalar value, indica indicates by how much the distribution gets stretched uh, or compressed in that case um, uh, at Q. So in that case here is the, is the compression ratio, it's the inverse of the derivative, so it's the compression, right? And so the more you compress here, uh, the more the, the probability will be high more P of Y will be large. The density P of Y for this Y will be large for a, a given uh, a Q. So this is uh, for Y equals F of Z. Okay. So the big question of um, uh, normalizing flow methods is, um, is how you, do, how you do this, right? Given a number of samples of P of Y, and given that you sample your distribution uh, Q, um, and you, you, you have your distribution Q, you sample from it, um, you know, how do you kind of minimize an objective function that uh, knowing that, that, you know, the P you get at the output is equal to the Q you put at the input multiplied by this sort of inverse determinant of the Jacobian of the F function. What you have to find is the F function. So you basically have to differentiate. So you basically compute a, a distance between those, you know, divergence, scale divergence, for example, between P of Y and the thing on the right side of the, of the, of the equal sign. Uh, and you have to differentiate this with respect to the parameters of F. So you have to basically propagate through the inverse gradient of the Jacobian of F, right? It's not easy. Very often what people do is that they write F as a succession of very simple Fs that only modify the, the distribution just a little bit. Um, so F very often is, you know, something like uh, the identity plus some deviation, a bit like ResNet if you want. And then you stack uh, lots and lots of layers of that. And the, the problem becomes simpler because when the uh, when those, those functions do a little bit of, uh, of modification, then the, a lot of those kind of issues kind of become, become simple. The, the determinant here kind of simplifies. Okay, that's a very sort of abstract high level description of uh, normalizing flow. Uh, there's, uh, um, yeah, interesting papers about this in recent, recent years on even recent months on sort of using this for like particle physics and stuff like that. Kyle Kramer at NYU is actually a kind of a specialist of that. Thank you so much, Professor. All right. Any other question? I okay. think that was it. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. See you tomorrow, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.